so I remember to do that. Andrew, we record the session so that we can post the video later for folks. And for, um, we haven't, the residency program has not yet figured out like the repository for where we're keeping all of these things, but um, I'm recording them so that we have them if we're able to do that. And then I won't even have to give it next year. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. So you can just send the recordings. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, Andrew, other questions or thoughts before we get started? Um, no, I think it's, I just hit share screen, right? Yeah, let me, I'll have to stop sharing screen. So um, give me just a, <laughs> all right, let's see. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to ITC. Hard to believe this is our six of eight intern teaching conferences um, for the year. Um, so we have two more after this, and then actually we're adding a last lecture during um, a protected intern teaching time um, at the end of the month that I'll tell you about in a bit, um, which I'm excited that we'll have time to do that as well. So um, really excited to have Dr. Andrew Chang with us this morning. So for those of you who have had the good fortune of already rotating at um, VA cards, you know Dr. Chang, he um, uh, helped create that rotation for our residency program a number of years ago now, and it's um, been a fan favorite with our interns ever since. Um, so Dr. Chang um, is going to talk about um, the ever important topic of how you approach chest pain. Um, so get your EKG hats on and um, get ready to talk and don't hesitate to speak up. This is a safe space. Um, so use this as a learning opportunity. Okay, so um, last chance to see scan in the QR code and then I am going to, then you can send me a chat if you missed it. So Andrew, I'm going to stop right. sharing. So now you share should share sharing. Let's see if this works. Share screen. All right. Did everyone see that? It looks great, Andrew. Perfect. All right. So, um, well, thanks for having me. And um, I like to, I guess, most, or I guess the interns have all been here for almost two months now. Yeah, that's so right. So you're like one sixth done with your <laughs> intern year. So congratulations. Um, so I, I haven't got to meet most of you yet, but um, I will hopefully get to meet most of you at, as you rotate rotation. And so today I'm going to talk about chest pain. And um, really, I'm going to give you scenarios that you might face in the inpatient service or when you're in wards. And I know chest pain can sometimes be quite daunting. And so what I hope to provide is just a framework for you to think about chest pain. And so when you see it on the wards, perhaps it won't be as fearful. Um, please answer, you know, feel free to unmute yourself, ask questions. I might ask people to read EKGs, though I don't know many of you. No pressure, just um, so that we can get a little bit interactive and so you won't fall asleep um, during this talk. So um, let's just get right into it. So, hmm. my next screen's not, my next slide is not moving. Let's see here. Okay. So as you guys know, chest pains are, you know, has a really very broad differential and, um, you can have all kinds of causes of chest pain from dermatologic, dermatologic to GI to pulmonary. But because I'm a cardiologist and um, I'm gonna really just focus today on cardiovascular chest pain, but you just need to keep in mind there's a lot of causes of chest pain. Um, and so always keep your differential broad. So, for us to really determine if this chest pain is actually cardiac or not, we have to rely on history. And I know that most of you probably already remember this from medical school, but I just wanted to briefly review what we would consider typical angina. So, and I think you also have to be careful because this is all gleaned by history. So you really have to be careful when you're getting in history to make sure you phrase things appropriately. So generally, typical angina is characterized as chest pain or pressure that's substernal. And there's been many times when I talk to a patient and I ask them, have you ever had chest pain? And they'll tell me, no, I never have chest pain. Um, and then at the end of the, end of the interview, I'll be like, well, 
have you ever had chest pressure? And they'll say, oh yeah, I have chest pressure every day. So you got to be really careful sometimes on how you phrase things um, and make sure that you're getting the history that, that you need. So chest pain, chest pressure, often a substernal kind of diffuse um, and usually associated, almost always associated with exertion or some type of activity and relieved with rest or nitroglycerin. Cardiac chest pain or chest pain caused from obstructive CAD generally lasts several minutes. And as you guys know, it can radiate to the arm, the jaw, the back. Um, it's not associated generally with respiration or position, so it doesn't change. And it can be associated with diaphoresis or nausea. So what are some characteristics that make you think this isn't cardiac, which is just, import, just as important? Um, so atypical chest pain is generally described as pain that can maybe be localized to, with a single finger if it's just one, it's the same spot. Obviously, if you can reproduce it by palpation or if it occurs with movement, um, it's less likely to be uh, chest pain related to obstructive CAD. And if a patient is complaining of chest pain and it's been going on for days um, and they come and see you and, and there's no troponin elevation, there's no EKG changes, it's unlikely to be related to obstructive CAD, particularly if it's constant and not associated with exertion. Um, and by the same token, if the chest pain is only lasting for a few seconds, um, pulsing chest pain, chest pain that feels like electricity going through their chest and it goes away very quickly, then that's also unlikely to be angina. So it's very important, I think, when you're trying to work up these patients, you have to really rely on the history. I do want to give um, a, one caveat, um, and that's if um, a patient's presenting acutely, for example, in the ER or in your clinic with a new onset chest pain um, that they've never had it before, then you do always have to make sure they're not having ACS. So when you, patients can present, you know, without any blockages in their blood vessels 10 minutes ago, but if they had an acute coronary syndrome, they can suddenly have an acute thrombus. That clean coronary now has a 90% stenosis and they can suddenly develop chest pain. So oftentimes patients who present with a STEMI, for example, may never have had chest pain in the, before. So when I think about a patient who's presenting to the ER or to the hospital and they have acute onset chest pain at rest, then I'm thinking either they're having an MI or, or they're having ACS, or maybe this is, if, you're, if they rule out, don't have any EKG changes, don't have um, troponin elevation, then I might start thinking about, oh, this might actually be atypical chest pain. So it's kind of the, a full spectrum there. So I like to turn now toward just several um, case scenarios. So we're gonna go over some case scenarios together. And what I like you guys to do is kind of think about what you would do in these situations. Um, and then we'll try to go over um, the cases together. So case number one, you're on call and um, you're cross covering a bunch of patients in the middle of the night, which I think you guys tend to do. And um, there's an orthopedic patient that you have on your list that you didn't get much sign out on other than it's just a routine surgery and you're just kind of watching the patient. And the RN calls you um, because the patient appears uncomfortable and is having substernal chest pain. There's no history of known CAD and all the sign out says is nothing to do. So what is your next step in management? Do you go ahead and order aspirin and heparin? Do you call your senior? Do you order a chest x-ray? Do you order an EKG? Or do you say, this is an orthopedic patient, I'm just gonna go back to sleep. So I'm sure that none of you guys are going to do E, um, but when we think about these scenarios, um, Oftentimes, you'll do a lot of different things at the same time. 
So I get a call from, you know, a nurse or, or someone that's worried about I want to know is what are their vitals? So you should ask the nurse or, or look in CPRS or look in Epic or wherever you're at, look at the patient's most recent vitals. So if they're, you know, if their blood pressure is 180 or 200, or if they're very hypotensive, your thought process is going to change immediately. And it also kind of help you decide, well, do I need to go see that patient right now immediately because they're, they're crumping? Or do I have a little bit of time to look into their chart, review their history? Um, and so that's, I think, an important thing. So ask for the vitals. And then if you're also, if the patient's having new onset chest pain, obviously you're worried about some type of acute cardiac event, go ahead and ask the nurse to get an EKG. And while they're getting an EKG, make sure that you look into the chart and try to find an old EKG. It's really important for you to compare EKGs. So if this patient, for example, having new onset chest pain has an EKG that shows a left bundle branch block, you're gonna be concerned because a left bundle branch block can be an ST elevation equivalent or a, a STEMI equivalent. However, if you go back and look at an EKG three months ago and they have that left bundle branch block, then you probably aren't gonna be quite as concerned about that EKG. And Andrew, I'll just jump in and say, you'll be glad to know that lots of folks put in, in the chat that they would choose D. Great. Perfect. Um, so kind of just rehashing, ask the nurse for the most current set of vitals, ask the nurse to get an EKG, go and try to get an EKG from a previous, either from that emission or if you have some EKGs from a previous emission, always important, always, always important to look at an old EKG to compare. Sometimes there'll be subtle changes that you won't even think is important but if you compare it to an ODKG, you say, well, that looks new. Maybe they have a little bit of ST depression or they have new T-wave inversions with chest pain. And that might help and kind of guide you and change your pretest probability of this being an acute coronary event. And of course, you want to go and see the patient. So when you're dealing with chest pain, always, always, always try to rule out the bad things first. And then once you rule out the bad things, then you can worry about things that are, are, are not as um, immediately concerning. And so from a cardiovascular perspective, we obviously worry about acute coronary syndrome. Their patient's having an MI, if they're having a STEMI or non-STEMI or even unstable angina. Um, aortic dissections can occur. They're probably not as common as you, um, you would see in terms of Often ACS is kind of in our differential, but you should always think about could something bad like an aortic dissection be occurring. Pericarditis um, is not necessarily a um, emergency, but if the patient has pericarditis or you're concerned about pericarditis and they're hypotensive, then you think about could this patient have developed a effusion, a pericardial effusion that causes hemodynamic compromise slash tamponade and that would be a medical emergency. Sometimes patients with severe aortic stenosis, or oftentimes patients with severe aortic stenosis, can also present with chest pain or angina, and that is um, a bad sign as well. Hey, the, Andrew. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Your voice just became a bit muffled. Is there something to about? Oh, there you go. I, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yep, we got you. Loud and clear. Okay. Not really sure why that is, but... Um, I'll just let so, you know if it happens again. Okay, so from a pulmonary perspective, we worry about things like um, acute PE, um, particularly if the patient had a traumatic event or they had a new procedure recently, like you put in a central line, um, then you might worry about a pneumothorax, and that can sometimes present with chest pain as well as usually shortness of breath. And then obviously with GI issues can mimic chest pain, pancreatitis, cholangitis. Um, again, if the patient's been instrumentized recently, you just did a EGD or if you just did a TEE um, and then suddenly the patient's having a lot of chest pain and difficulty, a ruptured esophagus can happen. Um, I haven't really seen that, but all those things are in the differential. 
So going back to this patient, you go and see the patient and you get a set of vitals and the heart rate is 38. The blood pressure is 92 over 42 and he's satting okay, 94% on two liters. And so it's also important to look at what was his more recent set of vitals. And so an, five hours ago, his heart rate was 70. Um, and then when you look at the patient, the patient looks uncomfortable. So, you know, one of the most important things when I go and see and evaluate a patient is I wanna see how uncomfortable they look. There's lots of times that I'll get a call from someone and says, this patient's having chest pain. And then I go and see that patient and they're fast asleep. And as soon as you know they're sleeping comfortably, you're probably not going to be quite as worried. But this patient is in moderate distress. He looks slightly diaphoretic. His lungs are clear. As we mentioned, he was bradycardic, but you don't hear any new murmurs. His abdomen is benign and he doesn't have any swelling um, in his extremities and he, he looks pretty well perfused. So the things here that would make me concerned is one, he's uncomfortable. Two, his blood pressures are a little bit low, not terribly low, but a little bit low. And then his heart rate's in the 30s, which is unusual for this patient. So you get this EKG. Um, and so here is where I like to have, do we have any volunteers that uh, this KG for us? You can, a group. Steven, um, can I call you out since you put something in the chat? And it's totally fine if it's wrong. We're just, you know, this is a very safe space. And I get EKGs okay. wrong or wrong all, all the right. time. Um, okay, we're getting some um, folks who said they can type in the chat. So David, why don't you go ahead and type in the chat since you already shared some thoughts. Um, and I'm getting a, another uh, chat that looks like the PR interval is getting longer. Perfect. But David, if you could type in the chat as well, that would be great. And anyone else? I'm here getting lead two and three ST elevation. Great. So some people see ST elevation. That's, that's great. Um, other people told me the PR is getting longer. Um, In inferior ST elevation and depression and anterior leads. Perfect. So you guys have aced this. So um, I'll go over it with you. So you know, when I look at an EKG, um, the first thing I do, particularly when a patient's a little bit unstable and you're getting worried, is I look at pretty quickly and make sure that there's nothing obvious that's wrong, right? Um, and then after that, I, I'll step back for a second and go through your kind of your progressions that you all learn in medical school. What's the axis? What's, is there a P before every QRS, a QRS for every P? and then um, look at your segment. Um, so just going over, I think you guys got this EKG, but let's just take a look really quickly. And if you look at two, three and AVF, and this is not like, you know, giant tombstones, but I think it's, it's, it is definitely there, you see some ST elevations. So you can kind of see, if you look at the TP segment compared to the ST segment, it is at least one box elevated. Um, so sometimes people, and it's a little confusing, sometimes say people look at the PR segment and compare it to the ST segment, or you can also look at the TP segment. In general, the teaching is you look at the TP segment because you know that that is at an isoelectric point. So you wanna compare that to your ST segments. The PR segment should also be isoelectric, but sometimes if you have atrial ischemia, for example, um, the PR can be depressed, and so it, it, it's not the best baseline to look at. But in any case, in this patient, you can see there's ST elevations in two, 
There's also ST elevations and three, again, this is a TP segment here is the ST elevations. And there's also ST elevations in AVF. And then you can also see in the lateral leads, it's a little subtle, but there's a little bit of ST depression. So you have some reciprocal ST depression. Um, and then if you talk about the rhythm, you know, you see, I always look at the rhythm strips. So I go down to the, the easily each EKG has a rhythm strip and I just look at the rhythm strip that gives me the clearest signal. So here I think you can see, you know, two and V1 are pretty clear, but two, you can clearly see the P waves. And so here you have a P wave, a QRS, and then you have another P wave, QRS that looks longer, and then you have a P wave, no QRS. So there's a drop. And you go back to this, short, longer, even longer. And then it's, here's a little bit tricky. I don't really see a P wave, but if you march it out, it's probably buried in the T wave, no QRS. And then you have another QRS complex here, no P wave. So this is probably a junctional escape. And then you go back to your P wave, short, long, drop, and then another short. So if you were to sum this EKG or kind of give a summary of this EKG, what would you say? And I think you've probably already answered it. So this patient looks like they're having an ST elevation MI and they have a second degree AV block Mobitz type one, otherwise is Winky block. Any questions about that? The other thing that you might notice is there are Q waves as well, right? In two, three and AVF. So this suggests to me that maybe this STEMI didn't happen just 10 minutes ago, but maybe it happened a couple hours ago. So maybe he didn't report his chest pain right away um, and that he's starting to Q wave out meaning that this is probably not just acute, he's already forming some Q waves. Hey, Andrew, can I ask um, you to um, just clarify, because this is always a question that comes up for um, folks, I think is um, differentiating acute versus chronic changes on an EKG. So can you clarify that this is a person who probably had underlying wanky block and then had a, 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 and that was the chronic change and then had an acute MI on top of that? Um, or are well, you... Do you want to do you want to help clarify the? Do, do we think this patient had a chronic winky bock, and then they had the ST elevations? I'm not exactly sure that's true because, as I mentioned before, right, his heart rate two to five hours ago when you got his vitals were in the 70s. Now you you would know that if you you'd have to really look at an EKG and compare and see if they had winky bock in the past. And that would suggest, oh, maybe this is, you know, Winky Bach that he had in the past, but then he had a, and now he's having ST elevation. Um, or is this all associated with that ST elevation, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second. Perfect. I think that's really helpful to clarify for folks. Um, so this may not have been, he may not have had Winky Bach in the past. You really won't know that until you look at um, previous EKGs. For example, if you saw you know, EKG three years ago or two years ago or you know, a month ago, and you saw that he had Winky Bach, then you might think, oh yeah, he probably had some underlying conduction abnormality already, and then he had this ST elevation MI. But we're gonna talk a little bit about why we think this may not be the case, and that, that this conduction abnormality by, might be new, uh, which okay. I'll talk a little bit about in um, the next couple slides. Thank you, and a question from the chat. Um, can you address when is a Q wave abnormal? And yeah. then would lead? So, so Q waves, you can always see Q waves in lead three. That's pretty, that's, that's not uncommon. So when I think about pathologic Q waves, you have to see them in contiguous leads. Meaning, for example, and, and we'll go over this in a minute, but contiguous leads include two, three, and AVF. So you wanna see them in at least two contiguous leads. Pathologic Q waves generally are at least one box wide and two box down, two box, you know, you, like you'll see at least a box to two box lower or 25% of the um, QRS complex. 
that's when you start thinking that they're pathologic. But if you just see a single Q wave, for example, particularly in LEAP3, um, then that can be just a, a, a normal variant. And then, you know, you can, patients can have an MI and they may never develop Q waves. So Q waves are suggestive that they had some type of cardiac injury or infarct in the past, but it's not, you don't always see them even if, they've, even if you know they've had an MI in the past. So hopefully that's helpful. Great, thank you. Um, so what are you gonna, I'm a little trouble moving slides, but let's see. So I wanted to, to briefly talk to you about the EKG criteria for an ST elevation MI. It's, um, you know, there's, I, I think the simple way to remember things, although it's, you know, if you really wanted to be really accurate, this is the criteria that you see on the slide. Generally, I say, if you have two, the EKG criteria for STEMI is at least two millimeters of ST elevation in the anterior leads, particularly V2 and V3. And you just need one millimeter of elevation in any of the other leads, but they have to be in contiguous leads. Again, we'll go over that in a second, what I mean by contiguous leads. And in general, you will, what will make you even more concerned that this is a STEMI is you'll see reciprocal ST depressions. Um, so if you have an inferior MI, um, sometimes you'll have ST depressions in AVL, for example. Um, if you have a anterior MI, look for, in, look for ST depressions in the inferior leads. Um, the other um, important thing that um, I want to emphasize, and you guys probably know this, but if you have a new left bundle branch block and the patient is having concerning symptoms, symptoms where you say this could be an MI, then you have to assume that this is an ST elevation MI. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is if, if you have a anterior LAD STEMI, that can cause conduction abnormalities, which can cause a new left bundle branch block. But when you have a new left bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block, it doesn't ha even have to be new, it is a bit challenging to see if there, there's actually ST elevations. Um, it's a, a, when you have a left bundle branch block, it's a bit difficult to interpret that EKG. So if you have an acute new left bundle, you're worried, could I've had an LAD STEMI or an LAD infarct? And then it's very difficult to see if there's actually ST elevations. And so we just assume that that is an ST elevation MI unless proven otherwise. So that's why it's really important to um, look at those old EKGs to make sure that uh, that new left bundle branch block is not new if they're having concerning symptoms. Now, if you see a new left bundle branch block, but that patient's not having any symptoms, then that is, you, you don't need to, to you know, call a STEMI code for that. And I get called about that, not, in, not unfrequently in the middle of the night, that uh, a patient has a new left bundle, but I ask them if they're having any symptoms and the patient's totally comfortable and, and sleeping. And so you don't need to bother your cardiologist if the patient has no symptoms and you just happen to see a new left bundle branch block in the middle of the night. But if they're having chest pain and, they're have, and you see a new left bundle, that's concerning. So now what do you want to do? So you're seeing this patient, you know, you're kind of by yourself, although you always have support. That's always important to remember. Um, and this patient is uncomfortable, having chest pain. You see a ST elevations in the inferior leads with a... Um, second degree MOBIS type one. So what's your plan? Anyone responding? I can't see the chat, unfortunately. That's okay, I can, um, I can monitor for you. Is there anybody who wants what to people, unmute or people want to into do. the chat? Cath lab. 
Okay, a couple of cath labs. And then a question about, can a patient sleep through an actual STEMI? Call for help. <laughs> can a patient sleep through an actual STEMI? Um, yes, they can. It's uncommon because usually people are uncomfortable when they have a STEMI. I've rarely seen people sleep through a STEMI. Um, I think if they have underlying neurologic issues or obviously if they're intubated, it becomes very challenging. And so then you just have to rely on the EKG changes. In general, people do get symptomatic, but sometimes they can't ex express their symptoms. And I've also seen STEMIs where they're just short of breath. They don't have any chest pain, but they're just short of breath. It's a little less common when you're having a, a new STEMI, a new ST elevation MI, but if the patient had chronic CAD, for example, they've had a 90 or 80% lesion that's been there and, and it's been stable and suddenly they completely occlude it, then they may not be as symptomatic as someone who had a 20% lesion and then suddenly occlude it. Um, so it's uncommon for someone to sleep through a STEM. <laughs> and if someone is, if you see ST elevation MIs, but the story does not fit, we always get concerned. When I see ST elevations and they're new and they're in contiguous sleeves and it looks like a STEMI, I do get concerned. But you need the story along with the EKG changes. So you always you need to use your clinical judgment. And then if you have time, you know, usually a STEMI is something that you will want to act upon quickly, right? So you don't wait for the troponins. But if it's, you think that this is unlikely to be a STEMI, and you, um, but you do see these EKG changes, sometimes or oftentimes what we will do, it's unfortunate you guys probably can't do this yourself, but we'll get our sonographers or we'll get the cardiologist to do a quick bedside echo. And if the walls, if their walls are all moving perfectly normal, then we're gonna be a lot less concerned, right? Because if you have an acute occlusion, you're gonna expect a wall motion abnormality. So sometimes we'll get a, you know, a stat echo, if we're not, if it's not clear to us that this is actually a STEM. Awesome. And so, just answer, Andrew, so the things that came through the chat are cath, um, uh, aspirin cath lab, um, fluids, consider pacemaker, don't give beta blocker, don't give nitrates. Perfect. So, well, let's talk about that. So the most important thing for you to do in this situation, this is a medical emergency. And as you know, time is muscle. And so this, and when you have an ST elevation MI, we're thinking this vessel is completely occluded, right? So they're not getting any blood flow. This is different from a non-STEMI where you may have an 80% new occlusion, but you're still having blood flow. Um, and so we wanna get this patient to the cath lab as soon as possible. And so that means calling the STEMI code if you're at Harborview or at the University of Washington, and we'll get, and that automatically brings the cardiologist in or gets the cardiologist involved. And our goal will be to get this patient to the cath lab. If you're at the VA, unfortunately, just so that you guys know, we don't have a 24 hour cath lab here. So if you're here at the, in the middle of the night, you still call a STEMI code and we have protocols to transfer that patient out. And we'll try to get that patient to Harbor. Generally, we, they will go straight to Harborview. So medications. So you want to start these patients on medicines. The most, the best medicine to give, if you only had one medicine to give in this situation, is aspirin. Old medicine, but it's probably the most efficacious medicine in this situation. Studies have shown that a aspirin in a setting of an acute coronary syndrome can reduce mortality anywhere from 25 to 50 percent. So that's that's you know incredible. That's huge. So you want to get them a full dose aspirin. This is a STEMI. So we know this is a medical emergency. And nowadays, no one is going to cabbage these patients in general. They're going to do PCI on this patient. So you can go ahead and load them with a P2Y12 inhibitor. So the ones that you are probably most familiar with is Plavix or Clopidogrel, but the medicine that actually has shown more benefit is Ticagrelor. So in the situation that 
a patient is presenting with ACS, and if you have the option, go ahead and load them with ticagrelor. And then if you have time, you also want them, want to start the patient on a heparin drip. So just to remember, you have this thrombus and what you're trying to do with your aspirin and your ticagrelor is prevent further platelet aggregation. So you put them on these antiplatelets and then with the heparin, you want to inhibit the coagulation cascade. Hey, Andrew, quick question in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, is the ticagrelor load given um, by the intern on the floor versus in the cath lab? And is there a variation between different hospital sites that you're aware of? So we would love you to give it on the floor. <laughs> Sometimes we give in the cath lab because it's not given in the floor. But you know, if I see a patient in the ER, so if you see this patient in the ER and they're having a STEMI, then you tell the ER doctor, load them a ticagrelor, give them an aspirin, put them on a heparin drip, let's get them to the cath lab. Now, sometimes we just get that patient quickly to the cath lab as soon as possible so they don't get on the heparin drip because usually that's something you have to call up. But you, the ER should have aspirin, they should have ticagrelor. If the, if the ER doesn't have ticagrelor or for some reason you can't get ticagrelor, then load them with Plavix. Um, but yes, if you don't do it, it's okay because we will do it in the cath lab. But we like to get that in as soon as possible. Um, so the other things that, you know, this is your mnemonic that I think people are still learning in medical school. I'm actually not sure, but someone's having ACS, you, you have this MONA or MONIB acronym. So give patients morphine if they're having chest pain, oxygen, although you only need to give oxygen if they're having trouble breathing. Um, so usually I don't give it unless their stats are less than 90 or they look pretty uncomfortable. There's a little bit of data saying that giving oxygen when they don't need it can make things worse. Unclear to me really why that is. It maybe has to do with inflammation and oxygen radicals. Um, but if they're uncomfortable or, they're, or if they're not breathing well, then obviously you will give them aspirin. Let's talk a little bit about nitro in this patient. Um, and then we want to give aspirin. And um, in general, if they are, if their blood pressures can tolerate, they don't look like they are fluid overloaded or having, um, you know, heart failure symptoms and they're not bradycardic, then you usually want to give them some beta blocker. I usually just do oral beta blocker unless they're very hypertensive. Um, to try to kind of release some of the stress on the heart. Um, we'll, we'll get back to this patient in a second, but um, this is also, I wanted to make sure we knew what contiguous leads are. So your contiguous leads, your inferior leads are 2, 3, and AVF, right? And usually if you have ST elevations and 2, 3, and AVF, you're thinking about an RCA um, lesion. So 2, 3, and AVF, inferior leads, RCA lesion. I kind of lump V1, V2, V3, and V4 together. They're your anterior septal leads. And if you have elevations in those leads, then you're thinking about an LAD lesion. And then your other contiguous leads are your lateral leads, V5, V6, lead one, and AVL. The teaching is if you have ST elevations on those leads, you're thinking more of a CERC lesion. And you should remember that ST elevations localize the lesion. So 2, 3, and AVF, usually it's an RCA lesion um, if they're right dominant. V1, V2, V3, V4, LAD lesion. But ST depressions do not localize. Um, so if you have, for example, 2, 3, and AVF ST depressions, then it could still be an LAD lesion. Um, but it's really important to know that when you have a STEMI, it, it helps to tell us when you're talking to the cardiologist where the STEMI, which leads are involved, so we kind of already have in our mind what blood vessel we need to focus on. So in this patient, we know, we think, we're, we're pretty sure that this patient's having an inferior STEMI and is probably involving the RCA. So 
when you have an RCA STEMI, it's very common to have associated conduction abnormalities. And why is that? Well, the RCA provides blood vessels or applies blood supply to the SA node and in certain situations, particularly if you have a right dominant RCA, right dominant means that the blood, the PDA, the posterior descending artery comes off the RCA. That occurs in about 80% of people. So most people also have some blood supply to the SA node and AV node. So if you have an acute STEMI and this is now occluded, then these nodes may become ischemic and you develop a conduction abnormality. And so that's kind of what I was trying to get at with that EKG that you saw earlier. If you have an anterior MI, an LAD, sometimes you can develop bundle branch blocks because they also supply blood to the septum and that can, um, and that can compromise the Hisperkinji system. So you might see bundle branch blocks associated with a, a, an LAD STEMI. In this situation, when you're thinking about an inferior STEMI, particularly if you have a little bit of time and you're not, you know, you're, you're waiting for the patient to go to the cath lab, they look a little bit hypotensive um, and um, you're worried about giving them nitroglycerin um, because they're hypotensive, then what you should probably do is do a right-sided EKG. And why is that? The inferior, the RCA, um, so anytime you, and this is particularly when you're seeing ST elevations in the inferior leads. And that's because the RCA gives off these small blood vessels called the RV marginal branches. And they supply the right ventricle. The right ventricle is a pretty weak muscle. It doesn't actually get a lot of blood supply. Um, but it is often supplied by the RCA. And so you wanna see if they have an RV infarct. And the way you can do that is to do a right-sided EKG. And it's very simple to do. You basically move the precordial leads to the right side, and you can kind of see that from this picture. Some people in the ER, they'll just move V4, V5, V6 down to the right side. And what you're looking for is ST elevations, particularly in V4, V5, or V6. And if you see that, that's diagnostic of an RV infarct. And if you see an RV infarct, how's that gonna change your management? Well, in most cases, you're still just gonna to try to get that patient to the cath lab as soon as possible, but you're gonna be much more cautious about giving this patient nitroglycerin because with an RV infarct, the RV can suddenly be down. So the RV was normal maybe a couple hours ago, but now the function is, is poor. And so the patient's going to be preload dependent and nitroglycerin decreases preload and you can get yourself into big trouble by giving them nitro. You also may need to give them fluid if they're hypotensive. So one thing to remember is when you see an inferior STEMI, think about doing a right-sided um, EKG. Any questions about that case? You guys hear me? Yep, I'm monitoring the chat, so I don't see any questions, Andrew, but I'll, let you, I'll definitely pause you if there's something that comes okay. up. Hopefully people are still awake, so we'll, we'll go to the next case. So this is a 67-year-old gentleman with um, a past medical history, whoops, of coronary artery disease. He had a PCI in 2015, and he presents with chest pain two hours ago, was retrosternal, seven out of 10, um, associated with nausea and diaphoresis. He was worried, took some nitroglycerin himself, the pain improved, but it didn't completely improve. And so he went um, to the ER, got some IV morphine, and now he's chest pain free. So we'll look at his EKG in a minute. His chest X-ray looks normal. His labs are okay, except he has a troponin of 0.6. And I can see that actually I, only, I don't have that much time, 15 minutes, so we're gonna go through this a little bit more quickly, this case. But 
let's look at this EKG. And again, it's important to look at old EKGs, but I'll just kind of walk you through this EKG. It looks like it's sinus rhythm. Again, I try to look at the lead where I can see the P waves clearly. If you just looked at three here, it's not so clear. Um, there's probably some artifact here, but if you look at V1, I think most people could say this is sinus rhythm. There's a P for every QRS. There's a QRS for every P. It's upright in lead one. It's upright in lead two. So this is sinus rhythm. The heart rate's not that fast, it's pretty normal. I see that they have a normal transition. I don't see any ST elevations. The intervals look okay. There is some non-specific ST changes. There's some flattening. So the way I would read this EKG is probably normal sinus rhythm with some non-specific ST changes. So you, you go and examine the patient in the ER and his vitals, blood pressure is 160 over 70, respiration 16, he's setting okay on room air, he looks comfortable, his lungs are clear, um, basically, his exam is benign. Um, and as I mentioned before, his chest pain had resolved. And so now, you know, this patient's stable. He has a troponin elevation, but you don't see any acute EKG changes. So you have time now to think about the patient a little bit more and get more of a history. So the patient tells you that for the last two or three months, he's been having chest pain with exertion. It's predictable. It occurs when he walks up a hill, it goes a couple flights of stairs, it was resolves with rest. So this story that he's giving you is very, very consistent with stable angina. Um, and he has this angina a couple times a week. But last evening, he noticed the chest tightness suddenly occurring at rest. It got worse while just sitting. It lasted for 20 minutes. Um, and that's why he took the nitroglycerin. It improved, um, but not completely resolved. And that's what brought him to the ER. He got the IV morphine and now his chest pain is resolved. So what do you do now? So you're admitting this patient. What does this patient have? Anyone? Got a couple, I'm getting votes for unstable angina. Is it unstable angina? And now I'm getting a vote for NSTEMI or NSTEMI versus unstable angina. Right, so that troponin's elevated, right? So this patient is not, so that's really helpful. He doesn't have any EKG changes, but he has a great story. He was probably having stable angina for the last two or three months, but now he suddenly is having chest pain at rest. Um, that's, you know, and you have a troponin elevation. So he meets criteria for a non-STEMI. So you should treat this patient as a non-STEMI slash acute coronary syndrome. And kind of, you just, when, I, when you're thinking about treating a patient with a non-STEMI slash ACS, you kind of have to think about just checking your boxes. So put the patient on aspirin. Think about a P2Y12 inhibitor. In general, we, the guidelines would suggest, go ahead and put a patient on a P2Y12 inhibitor if they're having a non-STEMI or having ACS. So Plavix or Ticagrelor, as I mentioned before, the data for Ticagrelor is a little bit better. Then think about putting, or not think, but go ahead and put this patient on either heparin or Lovenox. So I should let you know that from a cardiology perspective, we always prefer heparin over Lovenox, although the data really isn't compelling one way or the other. The reason we prefer heparin is because when we bring that patient to the cath lab and we if we have to stent them, we actually give them a lot of heparin. And to determine how much heparin we give, we have to figure out how thin their blood is. Um, so we get something like a PTT. If you give them Lovenox, it kind of screws up that calculation. And so we always prefer heparin, though the data is similar for Lovenox in terms of mortality benefit. Go ahead and treat this patient with a high dose statin. You should do that early on in their admission. 
there's actually a 30-day mortality benefit in giving patients high-dose statins um, when they present with ACS. So it's not just a short-term, it's not just a long-term benefit, but it actually has a short-term benefit. And then you treat the patient's chest pain, either with nitro or morphine. This patient's pretty hypertensive. His heart rate's fine. His EKG looked okay. So I would consider giving this patient a beta blocker, probably an oral beta blocker. Think about getting an echo. It doesn't have to be tonight, but at some point during this admission, he probably should get an echo to see what his LV function is and then follow up on his labs and, and you refer this patient to the cath lab. So your, in, your, your fellow colleague has did all of this for you. And so you admitted this patient and now you're the night float intern and you, this patient's all set to go to the cath lab in the morning. And then your job, you know, you're kind of following the patient, making sure he's okay. And you follow up on his troponins is 0 0.6 on admission and now it's 1.9. And Andrew, can I can I pause you? Um, because I think this is a perfect point. There's a question in the chat. Is it the symptoms that are most concerning in this case? So many patients come in with trope elevations that we say are type two and STEMI, and we don't do anything about it. Yeah, this this is the story. The story is very important, right? This patient. So when you think about a type two MI, you're thinking, is there some other cause, like the patient's septic, or you know this, or some other cause that's causing that troponin elevation. But here the patient's clearly having their primary issues cardiac. They're having cardiac issues. They're having chest pain that brought them in. No other inciting factor. So this makes you really think this is probably a type one MI. If the patient on the other hand, you know, had a, a anemia in their creatinine or their hematocrit was like really low and they were having some chest pain then that might make you think, oh, maybe this is not due to an acute thrombus, and maybe this is due to a supply mismatch. But in this situation, where they're coming in purely for cardiac issues and no other reason why they would be having um, this troponin elevation, you have to assume that's a type 1 MI. Um, so my question for you as the night float intern is you follow up his troponins, he's 0.6 to 1.9, what do you do? Get a vote for a new EKG. Okay. Do you need to call the cath lab? Do you, do you need to do anything else? Uh, EKG, and if no ST elevation, then trend the trope, call cards first thing in the morning. Okay. So my point is, remember this patient's chest pain free. He's had a true MI right? We think he's, this patient's had ACS. So you, it's not surprising that his troponin's going up. So I wouldn't be overly concerned if he's stable and he's chest pain free. It's okay to get an EKG, but you may not even need to get another EKG. If they're, you know, if they're sleeping, they're comfortable, you got the, you got the troponin. It is not surprising that that troponin's rising. Um, but you don't really need to do, you're already, you're already treating him. You have him on all the right meds. You have them going to the cath lab in the morning. Um, and so, you know, it's good to note that that troponin is rising, but there's not necessarily anything else you need to do right now. Then at midnight, you call the patient. He had been chest pain free and he was really comfortable, but then he went to the bathroom. He walked to the bathroom and he started getting more chest tightness radiating to his neck. So next steps, this is a situation where I would get another EKG. He's having new chest pain now, he's having new symptoms. So you get the EKG and you see this. Concerning, not concerning. What do you guys see? So in the, in the sake of time, I'll probably just answer or, or at least tell you what I see. Um, I think this is a bit of a concerning EKG. I don't see any obvious ST elevations where I say, oh, I got to bring this patient to the cath lab right now. And that's what I'm always thinking about, right? Maybe this non-STEMI has converted to a STEMI. And in that situation, it becomes a medical emergency and you want to bring the cath lab to the patient to the cath lab as soon as possible. 
But what I do see is I see some clear ST depressions in V4, V5, V6, maybe a little bit of ST depressions in the inferior leads as well, and there's maybe a little bit of AVR elevation. So, you know, for sure I see ST depressions in the lateral leads. I'm actually a little bit worried that this patient has diffuse ischemia, and I'm thinking, could this patient have multivessel disease or um, left main disease? That's kind of what I'm thinking in the back of my mind. So how does this change my management for tonight? Well, he's having chest pain. Um, he has some EKG changes. His blood pressures are fine. And so what you want to do is to treat the patient's chest pain. So, um, or his blood pressure is fine, is a little tachycardic. And so what you want to do is treat the chest pain and you probably want to try to treat the tachycardia. So in the acute setting, in the, in, when you're treating this patient, I would give him nitroglycerin, see if I can get that chest pain better. And I would go ahead and give some IV metoprolol to try to get his heart rate a little slower. So probably what happened is he has some critical lesions. He went to the bathroom, his heart rate went up and he's having chest pain. So, you know, this is concerning, but if you're able to get the chest pain under control, and you're able to get the ST changes um, resolved, then you probably don't need to bring that patient to the cath lab immediately. So if he's having ongoing chest pain, even with the nitroglycerin, or if the nitroglycerin makes the chest pain better, but he develops it again, that's the situation where you think about bringing that patient to the unit and starting him in on a nitro drip. However, it's really important to know if the patient's chest pain does not resolve or they become hemodynamically unstable, then that becomes more of a urgency to get the patient to the cath lab. So if you give this patient nitroglycerin, his chest pain gets better, he's more comfortable, then you know the plan is good, bring him to the cath lab in the morning um, and we'll see what we see, consider PCI. However, if the patient's having ongoing chest pain after you've treated him medically with nitro, even putting him on a nitro drip, then he may need to go to the cath lab that night. And it's always okay to call cardiology in these situations. You know, this patient's a bit unstable, and so it's also always reasonable to get cardiology's input. And the other important pearl is when the patient's having ongoing chest pain, make sure you get an EKG to make sure this doesn't turn into a STEMI, because then that becomes a medical emergency. Yeah, and we just want to emphasize that you should never feel like you have to do that on your own. You've got seniors, nocturnists, et cetera. That, that situation can be scary. And, and yeah, that's, so that's a scary situation, but a situation that you may encounter. Um, and so you just go back to the basics, look at the vitals, look at the blood pressure, look at the EKG. And um, certainly if the patient continues to have chest pain, you're pretty, in this patient you know is having ACS, and in those situations, even though they're not having a STEMI, we might bring those patients to the cath lab that night. So, you know, I always do this, so I need to shorten my presentation. I had a couple more cases, um, but we, it looks like we only have a couple minutes. Um, so let me, let me look, I wanna just show you a couple EKGs really quickly. Um, this is a patient that was presenting with chest pain, and I gave you two EKGs. Um, he was presenting with pleuritic chest pain. He has rheumatoid arthritis. Um, his chest pain was sound pleuritic, a bit positional, um, and you get this EKG. So what do people think? Diffuse ST elevations, concern for pericarditis. Perfect. Um, that's what I was getting at. You know, you, you, it's really easy to say, oh, this is pericarditis when you're looking at it um, kind of in this teaching, teaching um, situation. In real life, you know, I would look at this and I'd get a little nervous too, but I think this is consistent with pericarditis. 
he has PR depression, he has convex ST elevations in multiple leads. So it's hard to invoke a STEMI, a, a single a vessel, unless you're thinking that this patient had a acute thrombus in multiple vessels, it's kind of hard to invoke a STEMI from this. And what's happening in pericarditis is they're having diffuse because their whole pericardium is inflamed. So they get EKG changes in multiple leads. And then um, what's the treatment for, um, whoops. So the treatment for pericarditis is generally ibuprofen and colchicine. Um, you could probably, you should probably get an echo the next day to make sure there's not an effusion or, or something else more concerning. But in general, um, the treatment is high dose NSAIDs, colchicine for three months. If they, are, they can't tolerate ibuprofen, then you can also give them high dose aspirin. Um, so I think what I should do now is just in these last few minutes or seconds, um, see if there's any other questions. That's great, Andrew. Thank you. I'm going to call out a question from the chat. When you have a patient with chest pain and initial trope EKG changes, does the frequency and duration of repeating tropes depend on your suspicion for ischemic cause? Um, the story is the most important thing, unfortunately. So we rely on the story a lot. Now, sometimes, you know, let's say a patient comes in and you're not really sure that this is ACS, or you think maybe this is just demand ischemia. Um, and you get a troponin initially that's mildly elevated, um, like 0 0.05 or you know something low. Um, you can get a repeat troponin a little earlier than normal. Usually we say every six hours, but it's okay to get a troponin a little bit earlier to see if that's, you know, if that troponin is rising more quickly than you expect for demand ischemia, then you know that might help make your help you with management decisions. Um, so yes, you can get troponins earlier, and sometimes I actually do that when I'm worried about um, you know a STEMI. So for example, if a patient came in the ER um, an hour or two ago and they got a troponin and it was negative, and you're just getting caught, I might get another stat troponin. Because with the STEMI, those troponins rise pretty quickly. But in general, the troponin does not change your management immediately. Um, it's helpful when it's elevated, but if you're worried about acute events, sometimes that troponin is not going to be elevated. Um, I'll often just get them Q6, to be honest. But sometimes I'll get them a little bit earlier if I'm thinking, well, if their troponin rises more than I expect, then I'm going to treat them more like ACS. And so sometimes that's helpful. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, not to worry, Dr. Chang's um, present, <coughs> excuse me, presentation will be posted on our website as all the presentations. Um, please do take just a second to fill out your evaluation with the QR code. Um, and um, I will stay on for just a few minutes if anybody has other questions for Dr. Ching. Otherwise, thank you so much. Um, we appreciate you as always, and we'll see you next week. Andrew, did you have any thoughts to share as we close up? Um, no, I think that, you know, it's going to, oh, people are always nervous when they're dealing with cardiac issues in general, but hopefully um, as you go through the wards and you see this a little bit more, um, and as you look at more EKGs, um, things will be less daunting. Fantastic. Great. All right, everyone, we appreciate you. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Um, and as always, send me an email or chat if anything comes up. Thanks, Gabby. All right, uh, Andrew, hold on two seconds here. I'm gonna stop. I think, let's see if anybody else needs, I think we're good. I just like to leave this up in case anybody needs um, the QR code. Um, cool, Andrew, thank you for sending me your slides. I will send them um, to um, Brian, the guy who does our website um, and make sure that he gets them posted. Okay, yeah, it was, uh... I should have went a little faster, I think, but it always happens. It always <laughs> happens. It's uh, so hard. I think it's hard. Um...